This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Artica. Artica is a publisher, but it's actually much more, a place where books become art, a publisher that specialises in creating artisanal books together with the very best, most internationally renowned artists, managing to elevate different artistic disciplines to another level. If you'd like more information about Artica or its collection of artworks, go to articabooks.com to discover books transformed into authentic works of art. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their cultural experiences and influences, the artists that inspired their early lives and their current practice, the writers and poets who inform their work, the music they listen to in the studio and the cultural epiphanies that have marked their lives. And the first episode in this fifth series is A Brush With, Oscar Murillo. Oscar first shot to fame in the art world with paintings which attracted huge attention in 2013. Canvases with loose, scratchy, expressive marks, patches of pure colour and daily dust and grime from the studio, scrawled with words such as burrito, yucca and chorizo, grappling energetically with bodily movement, the history of paintings and the identities and stereotypes of Oscar's native Colombia. Such was the clamour around those paintings that they rather overshadowed Oscar's more complex practice which he's continued to explore ever since, with sculpture, installation, performance and film just as important to him as the paintings. At the heart of his work is a consistent engagement with language, with the nature of labour and production and with the movement of people and fluid cultural identities. Oscar was born in 1986 and lives and works between the village in which he initially grew up in Colombia, La Paila, and London where he moved as a child. He said that drawing was a cathartic language for him to explore the trauma of emigrating to East London. He eventually studied art, first at the University of Westminster in London and then at the Royal College of Art. There, he settled on the painting style that prompted that extraordinary burst of activity. But Oscar's been resistant to making paintings to meet demand. His first exhibition with the Mega Gallery David's Werner in 2014 was a fully functional sweet-making factory, such as the one where his parents worked in La Paila. One of the landmark moments of his career, and one which has confounded those who were convinced by the exponential rise of Oscar's paintings in the auction room that he was a market artist, was when the late Okui and Wazor chose to open his Venice Biennale exhibition with black canvases by Oscar hanging ominously over the entrance to the Biennale. Oscar has likened these black canvases, which have haunted his exhibition over the years, to skin. In some shows, to emphasise their macabre power, he's draped them over tables that evoke mortuary slabs. But when dealing with his complex subject matter, his approach can also be defiantly joyful. Through performances, installation and videos, Oscar's consistently reflected his Colombian homeland and his local community in London. For a performance at the Serpentine Gallery in London in 2012, the cleaner's late summer party, for instance, he invited his family, many of whom work in cleaning, as Oscar himself did before he was able to make a living with his art, to have a party in the Serpentine's pavilion. For Oscar, life and art are entwined, not only in the subject matter and form of his work, but in the way he creates restlessly. He lives to make art. He documents his travels with what he calls flight drawings, for instance. A new book, By Means of a Detour, documents one year of his life in 2019 as a kind of total artwork, culminating in him sharing the Turner Prize with the three other shortlisted artists in an act of unprecedented solidarity. Inevitably, as you'll hear in this interview, the pandemic has caused huge shifts in his life and work. I talked to Oscar at the Cardinal Pole School in Hackney, a new building but still the school he attended in London where he made his first steps to becoming an artist. He was there because of a major installation he's created with the help of the visionary producers of public work, Art Angel. It's the latest incarnation of Frequencies, a remarkable project made in collaboration with the sociologist and political scientist Clara Dublanc, where canvases were sent to more than 350 schools in 34 countries across the world, from Brazil to India, Kenya to Turkey, and of course the UK and Colombia. The canvases were affixed to desks where students aged between 10 and 16 could mark them, whether consciously or unconsciously, over several months with scribbles and statements, doodles and declarations. 40,000 of the canvases are gathered at Cardinal Pole School and accompanied by new paintings that Oscar's made on top of some of the children's canvases. I began our conversation by asking Oscar, how does he see the Extraordinary Frequencies project in relation to his own work? Frequencies has to be seen in all its breadth in, in, in relation to my work. It's a, it's a conceptual idea 
that embraces all the facets um, of my practice from collaboration, pre-making, mark making, uh, drawing, of course, um, ideas of, of society, uh, diversity, uh, geopolitics. So it, it is somewhat uh, um, a kind of index of sorts of, 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 of my thinking process. And absolutely, at the same time, it's, it's uh, radically uh, a separate entity because, you know, here we are in collaboration with thousands of children around the world. Um, and to safeguard and to protect and to to respect that collaboration, uh, the Frequencies Foundation was, was created uh, very much straight after the inception of the project. My colleague, Clara Dublong, who has been a, a bastion of a director of sorts, of a leader, um, she's a sociologist, so she's she really has, has, has driven this project forward. Um, and and I, I must say that if it wasn't for her energy and leadership, I don't, I don't think Frequencies would, would have the success that it has at, at reaching all different you know, parts of the world. Did the instigation of the project emerge from your own work, as in you were making work and you thought as a means of extending that, Frequencies offered a kind of alternative kind of means of exploring those ideas? I think I think it started without getting into into you know social political ideas. It, it started very much from from creativity. I was thinking about you know Picasso. I was thinking about the buffet. Um, I was thinking about you know primitivism. I was thinking about how or statements. Um, the idea of of, of uh, the the importance of the drawings of, of children uh, and the the honesty the transparency that and the and the attraction um and how artists have for decades and decades have have tried to unlearn which is something that becomes a little bit of, of a simulacra you know this idea of, of of performance of sorts um so i didn't want to pursue or go down the same path of of assuming something of of that nature i think in a way that already happens somewhat with um, my the catalyst paintings this idea of, of of the transfer of a mark using oil paint and automatism and an energy being transferred from the body into into the canvas and so i decided in in in, in that investigation to go straight to the source which are the kids <laughs> to make an initial approach i think it was it was initially very easy because i i i started in my former primary school in colombia uh, as, a, as an initial experiment to see if the idea of time, if the idea of sedimentation, the idea of the canvas as a recording device in, in, a, in, a, in a fixed intimate space uh, for, for a minimum amount of six months will throw back, you know, an intense amount of energy and an unconscious resolved engagement, unconscious also. And and you know, looking at what happened, you know, it was it was very astonishing. It was very, it was very beautiful. I think to see, as you saw, the the archive, you know, each each one of those canvases uh, has this appearance of a, of a nineteenth century manuscript or something. Um, so you immediately have this sense of respect of wanting to care, and and then we evolved and developed the archive from that point. Can you say something about that desire for the conscious and the unconscious to exist on the same plane? Because it's something that's very much there in your own work, isn't it? That you are you, you welcome accident and then there are very distinctive bursts of energy, that, as you describe it, on the canvas of your own work. And what is it that you want to achieve by bringing the conscious and the subconscious or unconscious into collision like that? Janice Cunelis said that the, the idea of creating form in painting is, is a little bit of a bourgeois idea. And I think of this kind of two very stream realities that coexisting, they kind of cancel each other out. I think the idea of, of, of the primitive mark, the, the honesty of the primitive mark. Um, so I think it, it, it stems from, from that. The idea of placing a canvas on a, on a desk, you know, here we are, you know, in a, ge in a geography classroom. It, you know, the classroom has a, has a function it has a has a structure you know you have these tables and you you sit down on a on a chair and and you know you have this kind of very formal reality and and in a way 
you know, if we could imagine that the canvas is effectively this recorder that is recording time and movement. I'm really interested in that idea of recording devices because it seems to me that what you're saying is effectively we cannot record thoughts, right? There is no physical way of recording thoughts. However, in frequencies, and again in your work, it seems to me that that's a lot of what's going on. It's a, it's a measure of, of the thinking process. Yeah, and in a way, these environments, they harness the unconscious to, to come out. I mean, very often you, you have children that will just wander off. And I, and I don't want to... To make it, let's say, that dramatic, or it doesn't have to be that dramatic. I think it's also about this idea of, of just making a mark. I think there's also a relationship to, you know, Dada, uh, surrealism. At the same time, I don't want to theorize too much or, or at all. Um, I think for me, it's enough to say, well, this is the approach that I will take in order to potentially get those results. And those results don't depend at all on me. I think that the only gesture is the gesture of offering the space that is already there. And therefore, the, the, this, this membrane that gets laid out, which is a recording device, you know, becomes part of the furniture very quickly because it's not intervening. So from that perspective, it's, it's the most that I could have done in a way. Um, you talked about Cunellis' view about, about the, the representation of form being a sort of bourgeois idea. And one of the things that you, you've spoken interestingly about is, is about the sort of democratization of making work, um, of, of the art process. And, and interestingly, you've spoken about how the art world is now beginning to find a way to process ideas of race, but it still has a real problem processing ideas of class. And I wondered about how frequencies relates to that in terms of you are bringing this into classrooms across the world of very different kinds and therefore it's a totally democratic means of expression i mean we're still in in, in a pandemic but how we spend the, the most critical part of the pandemic in in colombia in in my hometown I, I was very involved there with the community um i had access to the school um it was emotional to walk into a classroom and, and to see the date of the last lesson which was sometime in march you know, 2020, as if there was this, you know, death of something. And, and also the, the classrooms completely stripped of equipment and, and investment. I, I wrote my thesis in art school on the complications of, of education, politics, and, and, and the arts. And it was based on new Labour's policies on, on, you know, Tony Blair's policies on, on education. Because it, it, the reason why I, I became fascinated by it was because it, it was the time in which I came to this country in 1996, 97. And it was also a, a, a way to help me process what the society in which I, I now, you know, belong to. And so that dissertation, that thesis was a way to, to become conscious into a, the environment in which I was growing in privilege i think also you know the idea of, of of arts and class you know speaking of class i think for example you learn a lot about you know the mannerisms in, in which or, or how arts mm -hmm. validate or it becomes a kind of a, a ticket into a, a, a kind of a, a, an exclusive club and it also made me think of of my own kind of where i was coming from and the struggles of of a, of a very volatile and precarious society, you know, that Colombia is. And I think, you know, the, the focus for me as, a, as somebody who's, who's also, you know, racialized, who has a, a mother from, you know, African origins and, and same with my father and also indigenous origins, you know, in Colombia. I felt that the current discourse, you know, has been made into an economic discourse that is quite fascist also in the context of what prevails in the media platforms is a discourse of of what race is primarily in in, in the US in, in the United States or even here in the UK but then there is a, a total ignorance uh, of, of of the racial issues in, in Brazil for example uh, or even Colombia or or the Caribbean or in Central America or North America, you know, places like Mexico, where there is also tremendously 
large communities of black people. And ironically, you know, Brazil has the biggest population of black people outside of Africa, but nobody talks about that. So I have problems with that discourse. And therefore, for me, it's much more interesting to think about class, because I think class, it is indeed a, a, a condition that affects everybody, you know, regardless of, of race. Uh, and we know that in this country is tremendously pro problematic in, in relation to the divide of this country has, you know, between the, the North and the South and the same in the, in the States, you know, r related to the middle of America and the industry that is no longer there. You can talk about it also in Brazilian terms too, and in Colombia also, where, you know, all these, these black communities are, are marginalized. The place where I grew up is a, it's a very clear example of that where you know mostly what the black population does is, is work in the plantations so from a personal experience and, and I'm not here to kind of take away anybody else's experiences but from, from a personal experience of, of somebody also that comes from a you know a racialized background what has been more problematic is you know a working class and I think, you know, being here we are at Cardinal Paul School, you know, it, it was at the age of 11 when I came to this country, you know, it was an opportunity to, to experience diversity. You know, this school has been a tremendously diverse school with children from, from all, all walks of life. And I think that was incredibly influential in having this outlook, you know, in knowing that, of course, you know, there are, there are racial issues and, and tensions, but... In, in all the, the housing states that surround the school, there were people of, you know, backgrounds that were poor as well and that, you know, we were here together. And I think it's, it's difficult to ignore those realities. Uh, let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. The first question is, who was the first artist whose work you loved? You know, growing up in, in a small village in Colombia, it's impossible to ignore the influence of, of a builder. You know, I'll speak about these artists in a second, but to quote uh, Abraham Cruz Villegas' autoconstrucción, this idea of, in this kind of ad hoc, makeshift way, you know, kind of completely, again, seeing architecture as this kind of bourgeois truth, that you have this this builder, you know, kind of creating, you know, houses and this kind of very physical. So I was, I, I, I always, you know, when my parents went to work, I, I always will find myself in a construction site just helping around. So I think that was very influential. And, and I see those guys as the very first artists that, you know, had an influence on me. Could you say that they literally affected the way in which you thought about the means of working with materials? Yeah, I think like texture, texture, uh, space, you know, I think the idea of like installation, you know, how you see effectively a, a plot of land and, and that over a period of months it gets transformed uh, in, into into something, how spaces are divided. And and also I think on an on a equally important level, how, you know, in this very precarious way, the equipment that they were using, how they, you know, these kind of ingenious ways of, of making sure that things were you know, leveled or, you know, that obviously it is not safe, but th that precarity somehow was part of this idea of getting getting away with something, the kind of makeshift attitude, the idea of not having exactly always the right materials to complete the job. All of that was, you know, has been infused into my DNA for sure. That's amazing. I wanted to ask you about Mateos, those, those figures, the effigies that you've included in your work in recent years and how those marked you growing up because they've appeared after a certain point as far as I can tell and I wondered if they were a kind of recollection or if they they suddenly became a useful means for you to express your ideas well they in a kind of like folklore uh, existence they act as a kind of uh, as a spiritual mechanism or device to to spell bad energy uh, as, a, as a form of renewal you know at, at the end of every year you burn them and therefore there is this idea of getting rid of the, the bad energy for the year. But in the context of, of how I saw them in some shows and installations and performances and so on, I saw them as, as a representation of the working people, you know, the working classes. And in a way, they were also witnesses as I 
you know, traveled around and took them to different countries and different parts of the world. To me, they kind of represented that. Um, and also they had these kind of uniforms from different factories and, and the idea that those clothes were worn by people who worked in plantations and so on. There, there was also this idea of infiltrating them into this kind of art system too. But now, you know, when I when I went back to Colombia after the Turner Prize, I felt that it was time for them to go to the afterlife and we, we burned them. We did this collective burning and, you know, we, I did a video of that and they had like traveled so much. We had gone to so many places together that it was time to say goodbye and to shift the project and, and let them be, be a kind of memory or something. So you just handed me your phone on which I'm looking at a video of them. They're in a line and they're sort of, they in a, in a sense, they feel almost like corpses. They're sort of, it's a line of bodies. And now I'm seeing this, this extraordinary process where it's it's almost like um, dynamite or fireworks. So this is, there were explosives. So tell me about, about that process. The idea was, was exactly that, you know, to, to take 150 effigies that have traveled to Korea, China, uh, they were here in Britain, they were in Germany, started their lives in Spain. I think that was the first time uh, we went to Brussels as well, New York. Um, so I think it was um, to bring them back home and that journey to be celebrated almost in this kind of fireworks display that we did in, a, in the mountains. It was also very complicated too because you know they suddenly also found themselves in in the middle of a political crisis in Colombia because you know your relationship to it and even my relationship to them were very much in the context of my work in the context of exhibition making in a way and it was kind of a little bit frightening because right now in Colombia you know there is this tremendous volatile political situation for for decades people are are being presented, as we call them, the false positives, which is, you know, y usually young men from the countryside who, who get taken away and redressed into paramilitary, FARC, you know, guerrilla uniforms and killed to then be presented as guerrilla fighters taken out by the state. And I think, you know, right now that's still somehow very present you know, the national strikes that took place and are still very much taking place have been, you know, tremendously polemic. There is a, a show of, of violence by the state of uh, disappearing uh, and killing university students. And in a way, this installation, it's somehow in line with that too, in, in you know, in a Colombian context. So it it has that duality. Also, in a way, sadly too, reminds me of the precarious truth of education and the lack of opportunity the oppressive reality of a country like Colombia so it's it's a tough situation when you came to the west you traveled to London as you were 10 is that right it was just the ter had turned 11 yeah yeah um, and and you said that art was a means of processing the trauma of that travel from Colombia to a new society and I wonder if in that moment you talked about your encounter with western art at that time and how effectively you, you be, began translating that can you say something about that moment you know ironically the still life drawings that one does at school i think at the time in the curriculum you know like from the age of 13 14 still life drawing was very much part of the curriculum and and, and you would go home and you set up you know like you're still like you know with a like tomato and a carrot and and whatever kind of elongated you know, phallic shape you find, and then you do an arrangement of about six objects. And, you know, I think that can be related to my flight drawings, the poetics of flight drawings, which is this idea of flying, you know, this long haul flight. So even a, a one and a half hour flight to Berlin as a beautiful time to draw and to mark make. There was also this idea of like flying through terrain and that you were flying through different geographies and different you know, geopolitical borders and so on. You know, to go back to to the school, those still life drawings were a really good way to like be present, you know, to like, to kind of realize that I was no longer there and to also almost like cycling and to kind of get used to my new reality and to listen to the radio a lot. Um, so it was it was almost about meditation and, and, and therapy. 
Which historical artist do you turn to the most? You know, I mentioned Janis Cunelis. I think there is that attitude in Janis Cunelis. I was going to say Bury, but I, I think Janis Cunelis, again, you know, I think the arte povera, one could say that he was kind of on the younger side of that. But I think this idea of, of art made from, you know, a precarious existence coming out of trauma, you know, coming out of, of the war. I think, you know, someone like Janis Cunelis, you know, his show at the Prada Foundation in Venice was, uh, was very impressive. And I think, you know, uh, an artist like David Hammonds too, whose his, his radicality, what, whatever one says, what, you know, whether it is the system or, or, you know, race, I mean, to me, it's really the poetry of his work that I find very inspiring. Yeah, we'll come on to more contemporary artists and works in a moment because there are others that I wanted to talk to you about. But I was intrigued by recently, and I'm not sure if this is an homage to a particular artist or whether it's just being interested in them, but you made a group of paintings in which you were referring to Monet and the fact that he had cataracts and that idea of a kind of vision of the world interrupted and so how somehow that related to a mental processes, memory, etc. Tell me about that engagement with Monet, because what, do you admire Monet, or was it more that you were fascinated by something that happened to him? Well, you know, I, 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 it's both. It's more that it's kind of biographical, you know, this idea of him and cataracts and, and beauty, and the idea of social cataracts as something that is obviously, grammatically doesn't make sense, but Poetically, in your head, it does somehow, you know, that, you know, the idea of society having cataracts, you know, the idea of the, the fact that we're in this kind of blinded existence, you know, the facade of beauty and the darkness that takes place. So this idea of, of, of cataracts as, as darkness. I did, ironically, again, to go back to school when I was doing my A-levels here at the school in Cardinal Paul, because I, I did six from here, I was fascinated by colorism and, you know, the fauvist and, you know, um, impressionism and, and just color in, in, in general without, you know, criticality. But I think it was that kind of virtuosity that I had and, and the French impressionist was something that I, you know, was really into. But it wasn't until later that I read about Monet and, and his kind of bio- biography that I found like an interesting entry point that a- allowed me to, to visit those ideas and to kind of just delve into virtuosity and mark making in that way. And and that's a body of work that is very much developing and growing in the studio for the show I'm having at the end of the year at, at the Hague Museum in Holland. And in a way, it's kind of the perfect, you know, modernist space, you know, very kind of European and very traditional. So it's, it's a perfect context to, to do a show like that. And I'm also doing a similar kind of show in a church in in Merida, in Mexico City, because I, I feel that it, it is very much tied into religion too. You know, the idea of religion as this kind of indoctrinating institution. And I think the pandemic too, being in Colombia and in this hyper-religious context, it didn't change my perception of religion, but it, it my desire for openness and to understand the society that I was part of, the importance of, of the church, the Catholic church as the as this institution in a village like that, where people, you know, rely on the on the leadership of a priest, for example, particularly in the context of a pandemic. So I am not like retracting from from my kind of thinking, but I, ironically, it's becoming more informed, and it's not as kind of black and white as one would think. But I think it, it again is is due to this idea of of becoming, a, you know, a kind of codependent in the context of the church and the people and so on. I also wanted to ask you about Hans Harker because I know that in a show that you had in David's Ferner in London um, in 2019, there was a direct reference to Hans Harker and I wondered what he means to you. You know, he's a researcher, you know, an investigator. And when I was invited to be part of the group show uh, curated by my friend Leonie Radina at the Ludwig Museum in Cologne, we were discussing the effigies, we were discussing the, the seating arenas. And, you know, as I said earlier, the, the, you know, to me, the effigies have a relationship to like uh, the working classes, uh, to factory work, to exploitation, you know, and as, as I was exploring the, the collection, you see this beautiful investigative work by Hans Hacker, which is the, you know, the chocolate master. And it relates to, to Peter Ludwig and, and his dealings and his, you know, and his enterprise and almost you know, the museum as a kind of facade. And so I felt like there was a brilliant connection between the two. I did a very simple gesture by photocopying 
the work of, of Hans Hacke and having it as a cushion or as a sitting device within the context of the arena. And then I intervened it ever so slightly by making this kind of, you know, uh, water gestures. And then, of course, yes, indeed, uh, the Davies were a show in 2019, now you remember correctly. But that was already kind of being inspired by my trips to the, to the Ludwig Museum in Cologne. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Artica, a publisher that creates art with each of its publications. Artica specialises in developing unique artist books that propose new readings of the bodies of work of major artists across history. They create books that seem to be chiselled into sculptures, written on canvases or etched with the artist's intimate thoughts. Books that are works of art in themselves, thanks to the meticulous artisanal production process with which they've been created and the innovative concept behind each one. From Vincent van Gogh to Pablo Picasso to Jaime Plenza, Salvador Dali, Anthony Gaudí, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec and most recently Frida Kahlo. With this latest release containing Kahlo's most intimate and personal drawings, Artica offers a never-before-seen glimpse into the private world of the iconic Mexican painter. Check out this and other limited edition works by Artica at articabooks.com and discover books transformed into art. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I don't. I don't. I, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I like seeing exhibitions. I'm not interested in, like, obsessing over, like, one work or, or one, like, museum because of, of the architecture, because of the collection. Well, the interesting thing about, you know, you saying you, effectively you don't have a favourite museum. Is that, is that, in a way, about having a kind of autonomous language for yourself, which you don't want to be overly interrupted by yeah. consistently returning yeah. to others. So like, I, I never have art in my, I don't like art, you know, in my kind of, I don't like art in my kind of like periphery or like parameters. I, you know, I, I, I don't have any art in, in the house or, I mean, in the studio I have to, but the moment I feel like a work is completed, I kind of get it away from my sight because I, I think art or the idea of making a work is more about letting something out of my body and not contemplation. So even my own shows, I hate the fact that they're on my shows because I have seen them for so long that I, you know, you don't see them anymore. So it's frustrating. You know, I, like I wish I could just walk into my own exhibition without having had to spend months preparing them or, you know, even years. I wish I could just walk in. I think, you know, this is going to sound very arrogant, but I think I'll be very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> But does that mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in to what extent artists are historians of their own work. So if you want to get your work out from your studio and get it out from under your feet, as it were, does that mean that you have difficulty placing your own project across time? Or actually, can you can you kind of remember that, that making over time? And could you conceptualise a res retrospective of your own work in your head right now? Sort of thing? No, I wouldn't want to do one. As I get older, the idea of the retrospective is very frightening because it's like having too many children and suddenly, you know, all those kids, they come, you know, knocking for you. I mean, you know, the, the Julie Moretu survey, I saw, actually, I saw it in LA. That was incredible and very inspiring to see Julie's work. You know, she, I feel like she has a practice that, that is in line with this idea of the retrospective because I think it's a, it's a very an academic practice. You know, the idea of like drawing and painting and it's a very studios kind of, you know, practice. Even the books that I do, I don't like them to be too kind of egalitarian. But I, I want to like use the opportunity to do something, to keep experimenting. to keep And, and you know, for example, the show here at, at Cardinal Paul, we did it over 3D modeling. My colleagues were here in London, some were in, in Spain, I was in Colombia. And we had weeks and weeks of waking up and like like having this digital model on the computer and you move things around. And I think that, you know, the show would have been a totally different show had I had been here physically. But I'm really glad that we did it that way. It allowed for a, a more conceptual and, 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 and a very kind of ambitious, you know, like push, I think. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? I think making the, the radical jump from, I mean, even arriving here a couple of weeks ago, you know, I was waiting at, at, at the traffic light and I, and I suddenly realized everything was so clean. You know, I think that's 
beautiful. It is also a problem maybe, you know, that our relationship to matter and to like physicality and material is is diminishing. And I think when the city is, is you know, this displays itself as this kind of hyper clean urban environment, I think this is a problem. I think in a way it relates a little bit to something that Jeremy Della said related to the privatization of the city. You know, there, there, aren't, there aren't any spaces for leisure or, or to just simply sit. It makes me think about, you know, all sorts of things like, for example, you know, the town where I grew up where, you know, the parks are privately owned and they charge kids to go in there. And the kids obviously don't use it because it's expensive, you know. So in, in effect, what you're saying is that the sort of cultural experience that changed your life was the leap from your hometown in Colombia, La Paila, to, to London, and then that experience of seeing that shift over time. Yeah, just I think obviously is undeniable that my relationships from a, an emotional point of view are specific to London and to La Paila, because, you know, those are the places that I've lived, you know, over like... A great period of time and one cannot compare a tiny village on the equator to a, a city like London with all, all its history and development evolution whatever you want to call it but it, it is what happened you know it, that is the experience that took place. Let's talk about literature which writers or poets do you return to the most? I don't really read <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm dyslexic I don't right <laughs> I don't but due to this pandemic, I had to be in Mexico for a, for a, you know a bunch of time, and I I had the the blessing really to to spend time with Abraham Cruz Villegas, who had a beautiful turbine hall intervention, and and Dr. Lacra, who who was a, a, a great character and, and and again another tremendous artist. Damien Ortega too, um, who's a, another colossal figure in contemporary art and those guys we talked about Diego Rivera we talked about a lot of the historical social political you know realities of Mexico you know Abraham he's a writer too and and he wrote about his his practice through the lens of his childhood and and upbringing and again being you know being a, a young person who you know who whose family were activists but you know coming from the slums and it was very inspiring. I think it 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 reminded me of, of of my own kind of story. And his you know insatiable appetite for education and teaching was very contagious and and inspiring. Again, the last piece of writing and reading I did was when I did my dissertation ten years ago. And and again, I wrote it on education, society, and the arts. I've published it for this exhibition, so it's going to be part of this show here at Cardinal Paul. Because in a way, after 10 years, it's a little bit of a recollection. And to do the show in a school, it, it kind of makes sense. After coming from Colombia too, and, and the kind of the realities that you see there. But, you know, I, I think for me, reading is dis distracting. Again, this is why I don't have any, any art. And I don't really like art, because I have to think. And to read is to enter somebody else's thoughts. And I guess maybe this is, you know, to go back to frequencies, this is why frequencies, in a way, it becomes like, to me, like the, the ultimate work, because it, it is through the idea of, of this recording device, this kind of cradle of a space. It's just a very fluid thing, you know. But there are some literary references in your work. So, for instance, at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, there was a John Donne poem that, mm. that was on the wall as you entered the space, and, and it was somewhat submerged with paint. So it's the famous yeah. No Man is an Island. Well, you know, that's something that that it was an an, an, an homage to Oakwe and Wenzor. You know, we, we talked about, you know, Oakwe, you know, it, it will be his anniversary this this week, uh, t two years, you know, since he passed away. You know, 2019 was a, was a, it was a very turbulent year. And in a way, this book by a detour comes out of 2019. And the John Dunn poem, it's, it's in, a, in an homage to Oakwe, you know, this colossal figure that, you know, lost his battle with cancer and passed away. And I think for me, you know, it was a huge loss, even even though I am of a much, much younger generation. You know, he was he was definitely a father figure. And I think somebody who for me kind of despite again his his Nigerian 
heritage, you know, he, he was a man of the world. You know, he, he was very much a man of the world, a man who lived in the States and understood racial tensions there, but also understood art. And, and I think six years after his Venice Biennial, at the time it was, it was heavily criticized, but then year on year, it, 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 you know, it becomes so much of, of, in reference to society now. So just, like way, his just like his documentary. Just like his documentary, exactly. And so the John Donne poem was a, an homage to him. Let's talk about music now. What music do you listen to while you're working in the studio? You know, I listened to, like many, many years ago, I, I used to listen to like, pirate radio like latin music that was done by you know pirate djs and so on um and also radio that was being aired from colombia because there was this kind of like there was this disconnect uh also in terms of like the times zone and so on and now with the advent of spotify and so on i usually just i put it on on radio so like you create like this kind of like assembly of on the same kind of tonality Latin music mostly. I listen to uh, San Ra also, Nina Simone occasionally, uh, Fela Kuti as well. Fela Kuti. I actually listen to a lot of Fela Kuti. And Fela Kuti is featured in your work, hasn't he? Because there was this text that you wrote on a wall, sort of scrawled on a wall, which was Vagabonds in Power, and that relates to a, a, a song by him. Yeah, yeah. The, the title of the show was uh, Social Altitude in 2019 at the Aspen Art Museum. And in a way, I mean, that was a great show. I mean, I, I really love Aspen. I think it's a, it's a wonderful place because it, the nature there is tremendous. But, uh, and I, you know, it reminds me of my village, actually. It's very similar to my village <laughs> because it's it's got a similar population. But it's just, you know, the the, the stream is just, you know, animal, you can't imagine it. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, we definitely don't have Louis Vuitton stores in my village. <laughs> <laughs> but I love I love it. I, I think the nature there is, is is amazing. And so the show, you know, social altitude, uh, which is kind of in reference to all, you know the idea of Aspen being the, you know at that kind of altitude, is very similar to Bogota. Also, in relation to the fact that it's in a way it's a, it's a place of of crazy amount of like streams, you know, and and hence the idea of like VIP, you know, um, vagabonds in power, you know, this kind of reference to you know very important people um so it's kind of playing with like words and meaning and so on you mentioned salsa and in fact there was performances that you did there's this work called make it happen in steps in which you used salsa music can you say something about that it was a show i did in france it was a group of artists that got invited to do sculpture like outdoor sculpture and uh hugo rondinone was there i think Urs fisher oscar twazon was also there who, who I, I i love and i was also invited and 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 of course you know these artists they had their kind of representation and production and so on and i kind of made this shock you know where i was dancing and it happened again i did it when i did a show i isabella bortolozzi in berlin and i think what i remember about that show is not even the work itself but i remember just carrying everything you know from from london and jumping on a eurostar with like a lot of luggages and it was a show like you know, writing yucca or writing tamales in a painting. I think it was a show of of a similar kind of attitude. I think you know, when I when writing those words in those paintings, it was very embarrassing because it you're exposing yourself. But I think that you know, making those paintings were embarrassing. And I mentioned the paintings because I think the idea of like doing that it was a little bit embarrassing too for me. You know, like it, I was this very young artist that just had a lot of energy and, and, and was looking at ways of how I could share that energy, you know, and share it with an audience and, and make it into, into an experimental kind of project that I was beginning to, to put together. You made a, a video once where there was a very distinctive use of music. It was in 2015 that I saw it at David's Werner and it was a, a, a film which featured your local community. It was New Year's Day 
and yeah. there's this wonderful energetic music people are celebrating and then on the other hand there were these moments which were almost dreamlike slowed down and there was this sort of ambient bells that were produced mm. which you'd work with a composer on. yeah so that, that seemed to me that that told me that music was tremendously important in the way that you conceptualize the idea of of memory of of emotional attachment to place for instance yeah yeah i think that, that was a beautiful time where you know i would romanticize colombia i would romanticize the village i would romanticize this dual relationship with place and there was this kind of idea of like an idyllic almost like a little bit of voyeuristic and the video is a little bit that i think this play and and in discussion and in and in relation to the collaboration with the, my friend who doesn't want to be named when we worked on his composition it was kind of how do you tease out some of this kind of maybe darkness you know and i still do i i in an interview with maria belen sans de Ibarra, who's uh, the director of la universidad nacional in bogota we talked about darkness and we talked about the night in Colombia. It's very dark, you know, it has this dark energy. It's very heavy. And I think in a way it's, it's you know, you have like witches in, at night. Like witches came to my house at night. And, and then there's this relationship to spirituality and, and the smells of, of people like smoking tobacco, you know, like reading the tobacco at night and all those kind of mystical things. In a way, in the sense of that video, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good medium to kind of discuss those feelings. And I think the black canvas is too, for me. Uh, I think, if, if anything, the black canvases are about that energy that cannot be defined so easily or cannot be compartmentalized or, or cannot be kind of described so easily or so readily. And hence the black canvases. I think, you know, in the, in the context of the Venice Biennial, when I talked to Oakley about these things, the idea of, of when you enter the barrio, you're kind of entering the, uh, this unknown territory that, you know, is what we are now. You know, I mean, hence the title of the work, you know, Busted in Unknown Territory. And I think also it has to do with, like, migration, too. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? I have to like talk about the last year and a half, you know. I think living in, in, in Colombia, living in like the small town, you know, creating a group of friends, you know, going like off trail cycling into like the mountains and then the river and, you know, and doing that at 5.30 in the morning. I think it's like a ritual, you know, that I'm going to miss. If, you know, if, I mean, I'm definitely not doing that again for that same amount of time. But, you know, I'm definitely going to miss the beauty of doing that. You know, it's a very beautiful thing. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? My daughter's. You know, she made me this beautiful painting during the pandemic. And, I, and she, you know, I couldn't believe that FedEx arrives in La Paila. So I was very pleased to, to have that, you know, the beautiful painting she made me. That is, you know, that's the only art that I have. So you were separated from your children, right, while you were in in Colombia? Yeah, yeah, sadly. And you had that as a as a means of communication. Yeah, like kind of like a you know closeness. You know, it was. I mean, we obviously talked and and videoed and all those different things, but it was nice that you know the painting was you know was a beautiful gesture. And lastly, what is art for? Artists. To stay alive. I think I'll probably be dead if I wasn't an artist. Being back in Colombia, you know, living there for the time that I lived now, uh, you know, during this pandemic and witnessing, you know, what happens to the youth there. Things there are very straightforward. You, you're born, you, you grow up, you go to technical school, you work in the factories and then you retire and then you die. You know, literally people die after they've retired, you know, within several years. And if you don't, fit that kind of you know rigidity you know a lot of kids go into crime you know you go into like becoming you know an assassin or you know a drug dealer so i think i would have been an assassin you know i think it's seriously because i think there's a violence in the work that in a way channels that energy 
out. That's fascinating because I was thinking about when you were talking about the sanitization of cities and in a way, in a way it seems like your work as, as an insistence on physical and often it does feel quite violent. Mm. Yeah. Thank God for England. <laughs> Yeah. Oscar, thank you so much. Ben, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for the invitation. Oscar Murillo's Frequencies, presented by Art Angel, is a free exhibition at Cardinal Pole School in Hackney in London and continues until the 30th of August. Some canvases from the Frequencies project also feature alongside paintings in Oscar's exhibition at the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo until the 26th of September. Oscar is also in the painting show Mixing It Up, Painting Today, from the 9th of September until the 12th of December at the Haywood Gallery in London. The show In The Hague that he mentioned is at KM21 and runs from 11th December this year to the 17th of April 2022. Oscar's book, By Means of a Detour, co-published by Kettles Yard in Cambridge and the Kunstverein in Hamburg, is out now and priced £40 or €43. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues, which is back in September. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the Art Newspaper Podcasts are Judy Mahowska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Oscar Murillo. Join us next week for A Brush With Tino Sigal. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Artica. Go to articabooks.com to discover books transformed into authentic works of art.